Inside the Birds is back. What's up, everybody? We uh, hope you all have a great Memorial Day weekend. Adam Kaplan and Jeff Mosher here with another Inside the Birds. Um, haven't done this in a while, so having doing this uh, recording this, Adam, on Memorial Day weekend, want to continue to thank uh, everybody, our listeners, but also everybody uh, involved on the front line with this pandemic as we still continue to get through it. The Healthcare officials, the workers, the essential workers, the teachers, police, military, anybody who has to go out there uh, and work during this time to help others. We really appreciate it. How are you doing, Adam? You having a good uh, Memorial Day weekend? Yeah, look, you know, as we dropped this Monday morning, I mean, I was able to go outside a little bit, get walks in weathers, cooperating. We're going to have a very warm week coming up, uh, probably yeah. in the 80s as we progress here. So we're, 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 you know, we're on the precipice of summer. Uh, we always love that. Um, I'm hoping I, I, I doubt it, but I'm hoping to get to some training camps. So I'm not real optimistic about that. We don't even know when they're going to open. Uh, this is the first time in 21 years that, uh, there's a realistic chance. I won't go to any, uh, you know, we don't, we, you know, we just don't even know when training camps are going to open. We're not going to have OTAs. You know, Jeff, the interesting thing about this time, mm -hmm. this is where I would first get to, and I know you would as well. We would get to go to the rookie mini camp. Right. And then we would get, we, we go to OTAs then the mandatory mini camp. In mid June is when, uh, in 2017, Wentz had his. It was the. It was really the first time that I saw the mechanics for Carson Wentz take hold. You go, oh boy, this looks really interesting here. It looks like he's he's a changed quarterback. They made some mm -hmm. adjustments, and he looks special. And you know, especially he was in 2017. So, unfortunately, Jeff, this is what we're going to miss here, and uh, this is why we're here to inform the fans of what we know for everything that is not on the field right now. Yeah, and that's what this episode is going to be a lot about. We've been saying we're going to do this. Uh, we've got some news and notes we're going to go run through. But then after that, we're going to get into a lot of the questions that uh, fans have been sending us through Apple Podcasts, through the uh, InsideTheBirds.com, and through other platforms where you can ask a question to us. Oh, our Facebook page also, a lot of great questions. In fact, you put something out on the Facebook community page or group page, the Inside the Birds group page on Facebook, and we're going to get to some of those questions as well. I uh, just want to remind people they can catch our 53-man roster projection shows both on whatever platform they use for podcasts, but also on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to Inside the Birds YouTube because both videos are up now from offense and defense as we went through the entire roster and kind of broke it down on who's likely to make it or who's not. Uh, and please continue to join us on Facebook, Inside the Birds Facebook page, where we put all of our material but also our group our fit inside the birds facebook group where we are almost at 900 um i guess followers or 900 people uh, who are involved and a lot of great discussions are going on and like i mentioned adam was able to interact and draw a few questions from there yeah i'll and, be honest with you that's the mm -hmm. best place to answer your question i would i would say this there are probably there, there are four ways right there's our facebook message board which which by the way is by far the best way to get your question answered Apple is a close second. We obviously want you to subscribe and, and rate. And we took I took questions there for today for today's show, um, and obviously Twitter. But we we're not going to answer Eagles questions there pretty much unless we're asking for them there. Uh, where we used to use the Ask ITB hashtag, and then you could email us uh, if you want. But the, those will take longer to get to respond to. It's great when they're in one all in one area, and I love it when on the Apple on the Apple comment section or on our message board. I, all I did is take went right down the list and I just grabbed them all. Uh, Say for like two, I thought um, might be better for a different show, but uh, we're going to answer them. And uh, also I know Jeff, we've got some notes and some updates on running backs. We must've got 10 questions on it. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into that a lot. Um, last thing, just wanted to note that if, for people who haven't don't know yet or haven't listened uh, inside the birds is partnered with 97.3 in South Jersey, where we do their four o'clock football at four segment uh, every day, Monday through Friday. My days are Monday and Wednesday, Adam Kaplan on Thursday and Andrew DiCecco from inside the birds.com does Tuesdays and Fridays. So at four o'clock every single day, Monday through Friday, you get an inside the birds. We do about 20, 25 minutes with Mike Gill and Hunter Brody. And you can find that if you miss it, if you can't download the free mobile app, or if you're not in the listening area, and you want to hear any of these interviews, all of them are posted on our YouTube page, and they're usually up on the Inside the Birds YouTube page by about 5 o'clock-ish. So as long as you uh, get to our YouTube page, you will not miss any of our interviews. Adam has been dropping bombs on it. You know, Andrew Checo has been doing a great job. I'm on twice a week, too. So if you can't get it, make sure you're following it on the Inside the Birds YouTube page. 
All right. First, we said, Adam, we were going to start off with a few um, news and notes about uh, some things that we mentioned. Now, the last time we did Inside the Birds TV, uh, I had some information on Jalen Rager and I was uh, talking about the contract situation. Uh, it's amicable. I'll repeat what I said. It's It's been good. Uh, I have been told that talks are progressing. And um, anytime this is now we're recording this on Memorial Day weekend, you know, by middle of the week. A contract could be done and maybe even uh, hopefully by June 1st. I think both sides would like to have an agreement hammered out by that point uh, as we get into the uh, the summer months. So we'll see what happens. Uh, do you know, Adam, how many people right now, how many first round picks have signed? Not many, not many, yeah. uh, less than 10. So that's typical this time. Um, you know, it's funny. The Eagles, some, t- some years, they actually sign every rookie on the same day. But right. not this year because the six round pick will now go sign uh, earlier. Mm-hmm. the last week but yeah it's it's really not a big deal but it would be nice obviously it's always good to have them done uh so clearly because they're still gonna have the virtual off season uh you mm-hmm. want to make sure that that's that's done and having your players in them and uh the, the eagles have had a history very good history of getting the players signed on time or agree to uh, so they can move on now here's what's really interesting adam it's my understanding that uh i and i, I already talked about it in the last youtube is that uh just like every rookie uh, and everybody on the team, Jalen has been doing his his meetings every single day with either the coach, the, uh, Aaron Moorhead, or the assistant wide receivers coach. They all have their Zoom meetings, right? But I've been told that Doug and Howie have both have been meeting with Jalen Rager throughout the weeks as these goes by. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I can tell you is the coaches plan to get the ball in Jalen Rager's head. They're planning on it. They're envisioning getting him the ball, putting the ball in his hands in a variety of ways. Now, I, I was told that they ideally – would like him to play opposite to Sean, which would mean the X position, but they're also looking at him and going through the slot routes with him and just a whole lot of different types of plays that are designed to put the ball in his hands and make use of his ability to play in space. Yeah, so what you're talking about, if you go to his tape, you could actually go to YouTube and see his college TV tape, but you could see exactly what Jeff was talking about. There were a lot of gadget plays that he went through over his three years uh, at TCU and what they were trying to do is take advantage of, a, of him in space because he's so deceptive. He's almost like a running back with a ball in his hands. And he's so strong and physical. You know, he's well built for a guy who's just under five foot 11. And he's incredibly explosive with a ball in his hand. So I could certainly see why they want to do that. Yeah. And look, we, we knew that he was going to be line up at X. So I, what I find interesting is that you're saying they might, might line him up in the slot as well. And that makes some sense because Greg Wood is not fast. You'd love to get Rager in the slot one on one whether it's a, on a screen, a slot mm-hmm. screen, or on a, use a vertical slot, uh, that, that would be great. So that's good. That's good stuff here. And uh, that would make sense on why they keep meeting with him because they, it sounds like, based on what you've heard, that they're going to put a lot on his plate as long as he can handle it. As long as he can handle it. So the one thing I've been told he's working on a lot is using his hands to, f- to fend off press coverage because when you play the X, you know you're going to get the press coverage. Yep. So he's been working a lot on that. And also, when I say – uh, creative. I don't just mean X and slot, right? It sounds to me, and this is partly, this is me deducing from what I was told, is that if you go back to how they use Nelson Aguilar a lot uh, when, when Nelson was playing well, you know, he'd go in jet motion. They would give him a little counter sweep or a wing counter. It sounds like they want to use Jalen in that role where they're just figuring out ways to line him up all over and move him around and get the ball in his hands again to capitalize on his explosiveness and the space that's created within their offense. So yeah, it's going to be really interesting. That's great. And that that reminds me a lot of 2017 when Aguilar was at his best, where he was yeah. a real factor as a vertical slot and used some gadget plays. And uh, he was their designated deep threat. And you're, you're going to see that this year with Jalen Rager and John Hightower. Uh, assuming he makes the roster and is active on game day, he gives him something really interesting, by the way. He, he may be using the slot. I, I forgot to mention that. I had heard that some teams saw him as a vertical slot. Uh, the one, my, the only issue with Hightower is Jeff is he's thin. He needs to put some weight on. Rager sure. does not need to put any weight on. He's, uh, he's, he's pretty strong as it is, but that's good. Good stuff. Yeah. I also been told that at, when he works out at home, he has been consistently timing in the 40, depending on what day or what's going on between about a four, three and a four, four, which is really his speed. Not what you saw at the combine. It was a little heavier. We went through that. So he's back to running that impressive, impressive speed that made him in top, top, First round pick. Before we move on, well, the reason why he put weight on is he was not with his normal trainer 
about right. two weeks before the combine, he was with a different trainer. And for some stupid reason, they told him to, to put some weight on. No one could figure it out. And obviously he ran a slow 40 time. Well, then two weeks later, he dropped the 10 pounds that he, he'd gained and he's fine. And he, he his football speed is four, about a 4.35. Right. He is a very yep. unique, unique guy. You don't usually see guys built like he is because he's bulked up who runs like he can. It's a pretty unique player. It is. So very interesting. We'll see what happens when uh, everybody, everything convenes. Hopefully that'll happen uh, in about a month or so. And we'll see what goes on. Uh, I want to talk also about the running back situation because Carlos Hyde uh, agreed to a one-year deal with the Seahawks. You had reporting, been reporting a lot about the Eagles interest in him. And we've been talking about the Hyde and say Devonte Freeman dynamic going on between the Eagles and some other teams for about a week or two now. So wh where does this leave the Eagles, Adam? And why, what's your understanding? Cause I know you've been front and center with this on why the Seahawks did kind of an about face and went to Carlos Hyde. What's going on with Freeman here? Well, they wanted Freeman. Uh, right. I, two weeks ago, I was told that uh, they offered a deal that averaged about 3 million. It was actually a one-year deal, but the the three million, as NFL Network reported, could go up to four million. So my what I believe is that Freeman thinks he's worth more than that. And I was talking to someone who would who had knowledge of the situation. I said, uh, you know, why would he think that? He goes because he th still think in his mind he's a starter, but he wasn't going to start if he saw Chris Carson's their starting running back. Now he could have cut in Carson's role. It certainly helped in third down. He's an excellent pass catcher for running back. But he wasn't going to take Carson's job. And he thinks he's worth more than that. And the NFL Network reported something interesting, that he's done so well saving his money that he won't play this year if he doesn't get the deal that he wants. It sounds absurd, and I guarantee you that he will not sit out the season. Um, he's not 25 years old. Uh, he, he's, he's coming off three injury-plagued seasons, particularly the last two. Yeah, Good this luck. guy's got some crazy mindset. I mean, I like yeah, Devontae yeah. Freeman a lot. Good player, I think he's though. talented, player. but I yeah. mean, we know about the running back position. We know about his injuries. I mean, I, I don't understand the advice or guidance he's getting or else his own decision making. Good luck. It's just my opinion that he will not sit out the season, but uh, Mike Silver's got some good information uh, from NFL Network. I trust his source again. I'm just saying that the only guy who's tried it didn't get what he wanted. Uh, Le'Veon Bell did not get the deal that he thought he was going to get by sitting out. I mean, he got a good deal with the Jets, but it wasn't anywhere close to what he thought he was going to get. Right. Uh, the Russell, reality is, yeah. right. The reality is the older you are at running back, the less teams are going to be interested in you. But he's such a good football player that he does have interest. He had like four to six teams involved at varying levels. Uh, let's get over to Carlos Hyde. It's real simple. He goes one in him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were not going to give him anywhere close to what the Seahawks gave him. So you, you crossed him off the list. Freeman, the Eagles aren't going to get a deal done unless Freeman is willing to lower his asking price. So right now you can move on. Uh, as I reported uh, two weeks ago, I guess, whatever the hell it was, LaShaw McCoy, it's a guy who's on their list. Uh, and then after that, Jeff, here's my list of free agent running backs. who would make some sense. Mm -hmm. Lamar Miller would be a great fit because he could handle third down, high character guy, problem to an ACL he's coming back from. I don't know. I have not heard them pursuing signing him, but I'm just talking about fit. He would absolutely fit. Uh, behind Miles Sanders, who's the clear starter. Uh, Isaiah Crowell is strictly a first and second down power back. Uh, I talked to Crowell a couple of weeks ago under uh, through direct message. He's fully recovered from his torn Achilles. He's running. Uh, he's not He's not old. Uh, he's a power back. He doesn't give you the versatility, but he would fit in terms of what they're looking for to, to, to handle carries should Sanders not be able to play. Forget Marshawn Lynch. Bilal Powell's in his 30s, has versatility. Uh, the, the only question with him is how many carries could he handle? His guy could catch the football. I like Blab Powell a lot, yeah. to be honest with you. I know he's 30, but I like him. Yeah, he's I think he's like 31, turns 32 during the season. Yeah. Forget CJ Procise. He's been hurt too much. Spencer, where I was told, you know, they don't want him. Wendell Smallwood. Look, he matches up in a lot of ways, could play specials, but uh Wendell's had an injury history. And I don't know that I've not heard them on him and that's really it. I don't see anyone else. All right. So it's down to, it sounds like, I think we almost have to put Freeman aside for the moment because yes. his, his, his yeah. demands are so ridiculous. The Eagles Correct. are clearly not going to pay it. So shady or go with what they got. Yeah. And you made a really interesting point, which seemed simplistic at the time, but when I thought about it, it was pretty good. So you had said, we were talking about once Hyde went to Seattle, you said, this is great news for Corey Clement. And I'm like, yeah, yep. but then I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? 
if they don't sign Freeman, which right now has no chance of happening unless he's willing to lower his number. If you look at it, Jeff, the other guys that I mentioned, if Shady comes here, the guy was inactive for the Super Bowl. He didn't look like he had anything left last season, maybe maybe just a little bit, to try to get one, squeeze one more season out of him. To me, that really helps not, Corey, not only Corey Clement, who's a one-year deal with no guaranteed money, make the team. I, I think he could start rotating with Shady behind Sanders if they, do, if they did sign Shady. Right. If you told me, even if they do sign Shady, you're right. But it, let's say they don't, and they just go to camp with Corey Clement, and the two kids that they signed, Killens and Mike Warren and Elijah Holyfield, and you're telling me to predict the future, and the only thing I know is that all four stay healthy. I'm, I would think Corey Clement has the leg up. I just he's been oh, on this for team. Sure. For he's sure. proven himself. When he when he's healthy, he plays fairly well. That, that's it's been a while though. It's been since I, well, I know that's been a yeah. big big if. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's why they're looking for a veteran running back. So that's that all sense. I have on the look. There's really no one else left. It's. Uh, it, it's 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 gone now. Well, it's funny. It went from a total buyer's market two weeks ago mm-hmm. to it's now going back to the seller's market. But Freeman wants so much money that uh, the Eagles and other teams that I know of are not going to they're not going to do it. They're not going to pay him. It's just too much for a backup running back. And the Eagles were right. not the Eagles really. And, and I can't state this enough. They really want to take a look at those three backs, the uh, who are undrafted free agents, Holofield. And the two kids from this year's draft, they, they want to get an idea of them. That's why they only want to do a one-year deal because they, they feel really good that these guys will contribute in, in one of the, one or two of them will be on the roster next year and to contribute. Well, I think for our listeners, I would encourage them to go to our YouTube channel and check out Andrew DiCecco's interview on Friday, his football at four interview with uh, 97.3 ESPN, because he talked a lot about Mike Warren, yeah. the undrafted rookie free agent out of Cincinnati and what he does well and why, cause he's a bigger back. He's a, a 215 pound guy and why that that could give him the leg up in the competition. Even though the Eagles ha- are, have prioritized speed, I think you and I would both agree at the running back position, you'd like a little bit of you know power back uh, to be added in there for those fourth quarters. And um, it's hard for a rookie free agent to make a team, especially this year. But if you're going to find one guy to, to pound the table for, if he plays well, Mike Warren would probably be that guy. Andrew DiCecco saw him at the, I think, the East-West Shrine game yeah. and gave a really detailed report on what Mike Warren does well. So okay. I would go – Check that out on the stuff for ESPN. Very good. All right. We're going to get into some questions, Adam. You pulled them up. Thank you for doing that. Uh, before yeah. we do that, I got breaking news. Uh-oh. DraftKings Sportsbook. Yes, that DraftKings is now offering a mobile casino in Pennsylvania. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino offers an endless amount of casino games to play, all from the comfort and safety of your home. And right now, all first-time casino players can play up to $200 risk-free for the first 24 hours of casino play. So go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and find the casino games in the top navigation bar to stop playing, uh, to start playing. Options. You want options? Choose from slots, blackjack, roulette, table games, live dealers, and more. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino is a legal, safe, and secure than secure gaming app. You can deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. Plus, DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino is offering special promotions every day. So be sure to check the app daily. Now download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and casino app now and use the promo code ITB to play risk-free up to $200 in casino games for your first 24 hours. That's promo code ITB to play risk-free up to $200 for your first 24 hours of casino play on DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino. You got to be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, in partnership with Hollywood Casino and Penn National Racecourse. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, let's get into these questions, Adam. We got a lot of really good ones, so I'm going to kind of go in order here. These are from the first few we're going to take from our Facebook message board, and we're going to try to get through them, you know, bang, bang, bang. First one comes from Daniel Chinchar, and I apologize if I butcher any of these names, which I undoubtedly good. will. Oh, that was, all right, cool. I, I, I have the capital stamp of approval on that. <laughs> what are we hearing about Alshon Jeffrey, not only in relationship to, or relation to him being on the roster, but if he was the quote-unquote leak in the locker room and if he's on the team come the start of the season, in what ways do you see him contributing this year? Will he bounce back? Mm-hmm. This is a good leadoff question because, you know, you and I are a little bit on the uh, – I don't want to say opposite sides of the spectrum here, but we have different opinions on what's going to happen. Well, potentially. Yeah. Look, Jeff has been saying, he, I don't know why, but he, he has this, <laughs> this percentage, a smidgen that they could be able to trade him. Um, that would be a festivist miracle. Trust me that that's, you know, that I would call it a negative percentage. 
rest of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reason is he's 30, doesn't run very well, coming off a significant injury, bad one. This Frank for a player that's 30 at 30 years old is not good. And and Jeff, let's face it, before Alshon got hurt, you could just see him steadily decline in terms of not that he was ever fast. He wasn't moving very well. Uh, he did have a decent game before he got hurt, but the fact of the matter is, at this point, they're stuck with a contract for this season, mm-hmm. and they the fully guaranteed money. Quite frankly, is the reason why he's going to be on the roster. It's base salary, fully guaranteed. Plus, he has a uh, is he fully guaranteed option bonus, a small one, so it brings the the total compensation over eleven million. It's fully guaranteed. He's not going anywhere. No one's going to trade for him. They're not going to they're not going to take the contract. Who the hell would take the contract? Right. And that's where I have said, Adam, that I think a team, because I don't anticipate Alshon being ready by the start of the season. And I think Correct. we both agree it's likely yes. he'll start on PUP. So, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. No, the true. training camp, yeah. training yeah. camp, yes. Yeah. Helly, of course. Training camp PUP. We'll yes. see what happens in the regular to be. season. Right. Because what would happen is they have to, it was kind of like Alshon when he was coming back from the surgery from two, uh, two years ago in 18. You kind of monitor, okay, do we think he'll be ready week one? five or seven if we think we'll be back before week seven we're, we're gonna keep on the 53 man roster take him off pup and let him work his way back in practice on the side and then get him back into regular practice and start putting the clock on him okay do we think they'll start getting a real idea but we're, again we're almost in june here we're we're really far away from knowing but the fact of the matter is with alshon jeff he de- has one thing going for him he's six two and a half the only guy they have it with size at receiver is 6'2", is J.J. Ortega Whiteside, who did contribute last season. So my question to you is, is there a value, Jeff? Let's put the, let's put the contract aside here. Is there a value for putting this guy on the team? I think there could be a value, to put, and we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, if the Eagles are hit hard by injuries again at wide receiver and Alshon is healthy by late September or October or whenever, then I think that they would rethink – what they want to do with him. I think that they would put him on the field if they were, you know, trying to win games and, and he's healthy and ready to go. I, I sense the other way though, that if they're playing well, they're doing well offensively, they're relatively healthy and he's ready to go. I think if you talk, look at the trade deadline and you're able to move him, then that means the Eagles have already paid half of this year's salary, which makes whoever might want to trade for him. It makes the cost of, trading for him a lot less now when i say i think a team would trade for him i think it would be a competitive team that lost a wide receiver and needs a wide receiver and would give up a sixth round pick maybe a fifth or a sixth round pick i'm not talking about moving alshon jeffrey for a first or a second i i've seen that happen before with other players i think it could happen here um we'll just have to see the state of the eagles and the state of the nfl what other team yeah but see if teams get desperate at the deadline well yeah but here's the thing the eagles barring a barring something unforeseen, they're going to be a, a high, high playoff team. They're, they're, this team is better than last year by far with mm-hmm. everything they've added. Uh, I, I I could just tell you this. They're not going to cut. I, I This is an opinion based on reporting and get information gathering. They will not cut him unless they change their mind. Their plan is now not to cut him unless something, something forces them to cut him. And we'll get to the, the other part of Daniel's question. Mm-hmm. As far as the leak in the locker room, let's put it this way. What I think happened with Alshon, I haven't really said this before, it's just an opinion. I think he made some off-the-record comments to some people, and I think he was frustrated. And when players have done that uh, with either me or you or whoever in the past, I don't report them. I don't it, – it, it, I'm not criticizing any reporter or anybody else. I will make – you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go, hey, can I use this? Are you, are you cool with it? Or if not, uh, you know, when, I'll give you an example. When Chip Kelly was having issues with players. I did a lot of reporting. Uh, I kept like 90%. They, a lot of the players said I could use the stuff. I'm not, I, I didn't feel like it was, I didn't see a point in it until I needed to do it. And I used some stuff uh, and it got, look, it got pretty bad. You know, the Eagles got into my my grill a little bit. Some of the stuff I said about Chip, which is the truth, by the way. Uh, it, but our, our job is to make sure people are educated. So they learn. And as we discussed this, Jeff, my, my sense is that, Alshon made comments to some people and it got out. Uh, I don't think out, believe this or not. Now you could say what you want. I don't think Alshon was, was it was venom at, at Wentz. I think he was just frustrated. 
Yes. If I can, um, yeah. yeah, if I can add to what you're saying in an, an agreement, but also not reporting anything, just um, how I sense. Yeah. Because I, you know, I've been in the locker room, uh, so have you, and you hear Alshon speaks for reporters. He curses a lot. He says things that most athletes are conscious not to do, but he kind of has a, like this kind of, ch- like if you hear Alshon talk, you can hear it in his voice. He has a very kind of chill, like, you know, like an off the cuff type way of speaking. So it wouldn't surprise me if he's speaking in his normal Alshon way to somebody and then they kind of took something he said and made it seem a little bit bigger or just the fact that that part of what he may have said that was blown up. My, my point is Alshon doesn't really carefully craft his words like some athletes do. And, and, and by the that way, could get him in trouble sometimes. Right. He should know, okay, if you're talking to someone one-on-one, not around other people, and it's – could potentially be inflammatory you go hey don't put this out there but this is the way that i feel i you and i have been through this in our careers how many times has this happened a ton with me Mm -hmm. hundreds of Mm -hmm. times hey here's what you need to know um you know i didn't like that play call that bothered the bleep i'm just blowing some steam off because i'll ask them i I use discretion hey can i use it or not and that's it look if they if they say i can use it tough crap you know you said i can use it don't get mad at me right you know that's not my fault so that, right. That's kind of where that is. That and now, as far as bouncing back, Daniel, once it's once the, the injury is healed, it's a nine to 12, 12 month rehab. He, he, I mean, he could help them because again, our thing of what's that? We don't know if he. We don't know. I know he was hurt last last season. We didn't know that until uh, Howie Roseman said something about it. And then uh, then um, JJ, our thing of white side, admitted in an interview recently that yeah, he it was so bad he didn't know what he was doing. He said in his interview. When he went out in the field, he just he got it out to help the team, and you know I feel for the guy, but they mm-hmm. do need him because they need they need someone Jeff who's got some physicality to their game. You can't just put a bunch of fast guys. That you need somebody who could go after the football and is a little bit physical, don't you think? Yeah, it's nice to have a, a little a mix of yeah. uh, physical and of of speed actually. All right. So uh, yeah, but uh, and we'll see with our Sega White side what he brings uh, in year two. He's going to get hurt by the lack of off season camps, like a lot of yes. second year players yes. would be. All right, let's move on to Ali Richford, and he asks, do the Eagles' offseason moves indicate that they'll be focusing more on 12 personnel? And he notes that the speed on the edges to take the top off, you can make a defense pick their poison. And he says, um, my understanding is the offense was successful in that package last year, and hello and thank you from the U.K. So hello and thank you from over the pond or across the pond to Ali. And, uh, Adam, I, the question's confusing me a little bit because he asks – if they'll be focusing more on 12 personnel and talks about the addition of speed, no, nobody, play, as you and I have pointed out, they played the most 12 personnel, which is two tight ends in the league last year. So they've added speed. If anything, you may see, I don't look, they, they have great weapons in Ertz and Ertz and um, Goddard. I don't think they want to be completely different, but with the addition of speed, you might see a little bit more third down 11 personnel just to get that speed on the field. Yeah, certainly, and, and and you go you go eleven personnel on, on third down. That that's not all the time, but you will way more than you would go uh, twelve personnel because that's a that's a down where you need to spread things out and get some speed. All teams do if they go with the slot the slot receiver. Uh, yeah, I do, I do. I think in, in base, the, their base offense is going to be Sanders, two tight ends, and two receivers. Mm-hmm. That's to me, and the two receivers will be Rager and Jackson. We don't know about Jeffrey. We, we, no one could even speculate. Now, the other question would be, how do they get Ortega Whiteside and Goodwin on the field? Because Goodwin could flat out fly, and J.J. gives them some physicality if he knows what he's doing. And John Hightower is a guy that you can line up inside or outside. He could flat out fly. Uh, he would be a vertical slot if they use him inside, but he needs to get stronger physically. And obviously, Greg Ward, uh, if, you're in, if you're going on third down, you could use him in the slot and take – Got it off the field. It just depends on what you want to do. But the bottom line is, Jeff, they're going to be mainly a 12 personnel team because you have to account for their goal has been since they drafted Goddard is to have him be a bigger factor with Ertz. And obviously when Zach's done playing, he'll be the, the full-time starter. Right. And the other question is, as we've been talking about lately, is what if they extend Ertz's contract? Because that, that that would be fascinating how that would play into God, Goddard's future. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to see what they do there. Yes. I will say, I think in the red zone – is an area where they can probably get 
are you like to get bigger you prioritize you know size over speed so that's a package where you could see maybe Ortega Whiteside at one outside uh, spot maybe Rager or somebody else at the other outside spot and then the two tight ends in line and, and slot there so that, that's a way to be in 12 but to still get um Ortega Whiteside on this and, and use his size to that advantage let's Correct. talk uh let's get let's talk uh the, I'm sorry Let's get our question from Philip Peoples, also from the Facebook group. If they don't sign Jadavian Clowney or trade for Yannick Ngakwe, how do the Eagles plan to improve in the future their DN, DN position after Graham, given next year's, next year's draft looks light on quality defensive ends? Well, Jannard Avery is going to have to be one of those guys. The Eagles have not been, since Doug Peterson has been here, a situational pass rusher defensive end group. They don't, they've not done that. They haven't had that guy. Like when Vinny Curry comes in, he typically would move inside. Um, the only guy who really did it, if you want to say that, would be Chris Long. That's the one guy who did it over the four years. And Chris obviously was not with the team last year. Uh, mm-hmm. Chris came in to give him that role uh, to, you know, to, on third down, and then they'd move Cox inside or whoever it would be. Um, Graham inside, of course. Now I think Avery could be the situational pass rusher guy. You could stand them up too, by the way. There's certain things you can do. And the thing that Jim Jim Schwartz could not do and since he's been here is be as creative as, as he would like because they simply have not had the help on the back end, Jeff. So the the hope is with the new additions on the back end, obviously Slate, Nicole Roby Coleman, Will Parks, uh, Kayvon Wallace, whenever he just whenever he gets on the field and Craven LeBlanc now is with them for a full season. They're gonna be able to do some different things that they couldn't do before. But you know, defensive end. To answer to, to fully answer this, Sharif Miller Jeff has got to get on the field. You know he didn't play last year, which was expected. But this mm-hmm. year, one way or the other, if they don't trade for defensive end, which right now it seems remote or remote or signing a veteran, uh, they've got they got to figure out a way to get him on the field. I, I feel like the question's a really good question, Adam, and we'll probably get our answers more throughout the season because. When you break it down, first of all, Barnett has an opportunity to have a really nice season and get himself a contract extension. Um, so he could be one of your future starting defensive ends. And if he stays healthy and is productive, you'll feel good about it. The thing about Avery and the thing about Sweat, for different reasons, I feel like they're always going to be situational and not starters. Sweat because of the, the injury and the knee history. And Avery because of the size. I don't know if they project him as a – 50 snap a type of a player, a starting uh, a good run stopper along with being a good pass rusher. You, you've mentioned many times he's got that speed. He's a great curveball to throw at you. I don't know if he'll ever be a starter. So I think you're right. I mean, Sharif Miller, we have to see if he has the capability of making that improvement to where he is a, you know, two or three down defensive end where he's on the field for the pass rush and for, to stop the run. Right. So right now. you're right. Fill, filling Brandon Graham's role is not going to be easy after this year. It's a great question. Um, they don't, Sharif Miller, they're hopeful that will get some snaps that will not only be active every game, get some snaps. And the third year, let's, let's say Brandon, Brandon retires. Mm-hmm. Maybe he is their third end uh, because I don't know that Joshua can, is just not going to be a starter. He's not going to hold up playing a lot of snaps. Uh, you know, right. Derek Barnett, they have him for 21 too. Cause remember they, they rolled over his fifth year option, but that's only guaranteed for injury in this, you know, they're still under the old CBA with anyone who's drafted before the season. So they could still get rid of him. Uh, I, I would not, I would not rule out um, an addition of a, a defensive end who could be here a long, a, a long time uh, via trade or, or free agency. But right now that seems remote because uh, we you guys can't get physicals and uh, the money that they, they got a real issue for 2021 in terms of contract structure, increase in, 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 in cash and increase obviously under the cap. Uh, it's going to be fascinating. This is the first time in Howie Roseman's career here that he actually has a real issue that he's got to get through here and manipulate it. It, it, it There are ways they could do it, and we, we've talked about it. You could actually listen to that show, which we did about three weeks ago. Um, that was fun to do, actually two or three weeks ago. But moving on, Jeff, uh, let's get to the next question. Yeah, this is a good question yeah. uh, from Aaron Puga. How much homework did the Eagles do on Andre Dillard during the draft process? We all heard how he traded up because Andre was a top 10 talent, but I don't remember hearing Andre visiting the Eagles or any interviews with the team. 
if the Eagles would have had those interviews, don't you think they would have found out how prepared he was for the NFL when it comes to the mental part of the game? It's a good question because there's so we've we've talked about this a little bit. Yeah, of the vetting process. Now I don't think he was in. He wasn't. For no, a top they, uh, right. So what happened is um, Jeff Statlin had a phone conversation with him because he couldn't get in front of him. Right. Um, but that, to be honest with you, Aaron, I get the question. It's one that I was curious about how much vetting they did. They did. They had a ton. They have a, they have a West Coast scout. They have an over the top scout. Their 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 job is to vet the vet everything, vet all the information. Look, I'm going to give an example. Hey, you just never know. Sidney Jones was a guy that you never heard anything negative about uh, before the draft. Yeah, he, he t- suffered a torn Achilles, unfortunately, uh, during um, a, a, uh, a pro day. And he went from being a first-round pick to a second-round pick. Now, last year, we saw some things that were troubling. Uh, competitiveness, uh, getting through some challenges when you're not playing well. If you watched him closely, it Jeff, I mean, that Green Bay game was ridiculous when he grabbed his hamstring. I mean, yes. that, that, there's the kind of things that you're not going to know. Unless it, unless you found one source, because teams, by the way, their scouts all have sources They, they with each program that they, they're go-to people to find out mental, mental and how they are day-to-day. Uh, no one ever said anything about City Jones. I could tell you, because I talked to other teams about this, about did, was there anything in the scouting report? Uh, and we'll see about City Jones this season. Uh, Andre Diller? Did, did no, I did not hear of anything. Um, the question now is though, because it's come out, you know, you, you see different articles written in, in, in uh, by the local media, and we, we've talked about it. Goodness gracious, last October when we first heard about it, um, right? Both of us were hearing stuff, so they did their homework. But I, I to answer your question, I don't know, Jeff, that how much it would have mattered. I mean, you can look a guy in the eye, that's great, but you need to know how he is day to day and how much he cares, yeah. Yeah. No, I do want to address one thing, though, Adam. I think that is fair, right? Andre Dillard, they traded up to 22 to get him. He was the first offensive tackle taken, but it was 22, which kind of showed you the weakness of the offensive tackle class last year compared to most years where you see two or three offensive tackles go in the top 10. Um, I have been I checked in three or four when those stories came out about him being traded or whatever. And I asked a lot of the scouts I spoke to and personnel people, where would Dillard be among this year's offensive tackle class? And more than two or three told me he wouldn't be in the top three or four. So I'm sure the Eagles wouldn't say that. They're going to tell you all the great things, that they loved him. He'd be as good as anybody coming out. I'm just telling you, I had at least four different personnel people tell me that they had at least three or four offensive tackles who they felt were better prospects than on this year than Andre Dillard coming out. Yeah, on that, though – Dillard's a better athlete than those guys, but he's not physically as strong as any of those guys. That that's mm-hmm. the difference. And you know, Dillard does. We, you know, I, I I was told that he's definitely has kept his weight up. He's somewhere between three ten and three fifteen. That's where they want him. So he's kept his weight up. But until he's until he is in your building on your practice field, you don't really know where he is. Uh, this is this is an important off season for him. And as you said earlier, man, some of these guys not getting on the getting on the field. Uh, get Arthago Whiteside, second year players. Rookies, this is all I get. All 30 teams are going through this, but it's certainly an issue. Yeah, when you say better athlete, do you mean better pass protector? Because I, I have a hard time believing Dillard would be a better athlete than Makai Becton. Oh, he no, D- Dillard's other. feet are better, but he's not. Yeah. The problem is when you're not physically strong enough, uh, it starts impacting your hand usage and your right. footwork because they're tied together. So that, that would be a concern of mine. And again, him not being here, them not being able to have him under their auspices, so to speak, they can't really tell. Right. All right, move on to Shane Babchek's question. And he asked, and we touched on a little bit, what intel do we have on Jannard Avery? Is he strictly a rotational pass rusher, or can he play any stand-up linebacker? Does Schwartz see him have, has, having a role this year? And he'd also like to know how the team feels about Trevor Williams. So we'll start with Avery. Yeah, hey, look, he's going to be a situational pass rusher at best. Right. He's smaller. He's fast as hell. They don't have anyone like him on the team. Haven't anyone like him in God knows. I could have to go way back. Uh, he's just fast. He's got great get off his tape. Two years ago with Cleveland was pretty intriguing. That's why the Eagles traded for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had their eye on him. Uh, as far you know, as I said earlier, he could be a stand up linebacker in a way. That's what I think they're going to do with him. Use him in a variety of ways. And again, as I said earlier, Schwartz could not do anything because they just didn't have the personnel on the back end to try some different stuff. 
that's kind of where I see it there. And he is, you know, he's under six one. He's yeah. I'm I'm six foot one half inch. He's about my size. He's just in terms of height. Yeah. You saw him in the locker room. I remember you saying to me, "Did you see Avery?" I'm like, "Yeah, he is really small." Yeah, but sure. I can't see him fast. being a. Uh... You know, it, it, I can't see him being James Harrison. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's I not strong enough. Situational. Yeah, right, he's got. Right. You got to use him in a way. I don't know he can play the run. Twelve to fifteen snaps a game where you use the speed. That's really right. Good. And Trevor Williams is a guy that I think that they feel like has some upside. He's got some nice size to him. He was a uh, he's a former Charger, if I'm not mistaken. Adam. Correct. Trevor yep, Williams. Yeah. Right. Yep. Penn State. Penn State fourth guy. or fifth. Right. Fourth or fifth corner that the, the, they they see him as. And I'll be honest with you. He's got a real chance to make the team. Yeah. After the top three guys, uh, Maddox, Slay, Roby Coleman, Jones's role, assuming he loses to uh, Maddox for the starting job, he's a fourth corner. That's all he is. Russell Douglas, uh, long shot to me to make the team. Mm-hmm. Trevor Williams will have a chance. Prince Smith, more desperate to the practice squad. By the way, they were very late at corner. They could probably use a little bit more competition. I mean, well, that's probably why he has an opportunity to make yep. the team year as a yep. backup corner more so than an, on a different team because this team really needs corners right they, they have numbers but in terms of overall guys that you really would want to dress on game day right especially guys with size adam i mean they yeah. have no guys with size so yeah the only guy they have i mean sydney's 511 ish right. maddox is 59 roby coleman's 572 two tenths slay is 511 ish slay is like the only guy with size and, and yeah. jalen mills has size but they don't want him on the outside so right he's gonna uh, play play some sort of hybrid role correct right all right mark topley asks, and this is a really good question what are the pluses and minuses of playing offense primarily with two tight ends on the field versus three wide receivers and there's 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 really a lot of uh there's a lot of layers to that you know i I don't think i think it's team specific there's advantages for the eagles to play two tight ends because they have two really good tight ends i don't think that if they had two average tight ends they would play as much 12 personnel so the answer to the first part is when you, any coach has to adjust to hit the strengths of his roster. And when you have a Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz, you got to get them both on the field. And that requires 12 personnel. Right. So here's what you do. You're declaring when you're 11 personnel, three receivers, particularly mm-hmm. if they do a package with Deshaun and Goodwin on the outside and rigor in the slot, how the hell are you going to cover them? Right. And, and that's, you're declaring, you're saying, okay, no team in the National Football League has the speed to stay up with those th- those three guys. Okay, why? Because they run in the four threes. No, no chance in hell they, they're going to be able to cover those guys. You're you're forcing the opponent to go with slower corners. Like maybe their number one corner is fast. Their two is probably not going to be as fast. Their three certainly won't be as fast. Typically, mm-hmm. and then what you do is you can either have Ertz and then Goddard. By the way, Goddard on tape is a little bit more explosive than Ertz. Right. So you could have. You could have some unique stuff. You could have a package where you have Sanders, and by the way, Hurts on the field. You, you, we had mentioned uh, on our in our YouTube, uh, our ITB TV, our last one, Jeff, about remembering the, the Jordan Howard package with Sanders against Buffalo when when um, when Jordan Howard was the up back playing the fullback, and he, he laid a block out, and Sanders had the long right. touchdown run. Right. There's so much you can do when you have speed. You're forcing the team to put slower players of the field that's it it's just the yeah. way it is and it's all it's about coaches talk about a lot about dictating also what they want out of the defense so when you put your right. two tight end pack and this is starting to change a little bit i'll talk about that in a second but okay. when you put your two tight end package on the field a lot of times the defense is going to put their base three linebacker defense on the field and when you have good fast or good matchups of tight ends you like that matchup of your flex tight end against their third linebacker their will linebacker uh, you would love Zach Ertz against any third string linebacker or third linebacker, I should say. However, that school of thought is starting to change a little bit because there are a lot of teams now who are still staying in their nickel defense, even when the opponent brings two tight ends onto the field. So you're starting to see the adjustment on defenses by that offensive adjustment to put two tight ends on the field. So, uh, so now in that case, if a team stays in nickel, you'll have Zach Ertz matched up in the, let's say he's flexed out. Uh, against a nickel corner instead of a linebacker that could still be a good matchup by the way because now you have size of a tight end versus a nickel corner however nickel corners are probably going to be faster runners than your third linebacker depending on what team you're facing they should be not some nickels are fast some are not fast some are just physical and tough to go up a slot against a slot receiver but the difference between this season and any season that Doug Peterson's been here been in Philly he's never had speed like this 
And if 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 Rager knows what he's doing and Hightower knows what he's doing, Goodwin should have no problem. Same terminology, West Coast. Uh, he he's a veteran. They they could do so many unique things. I know people would talk about Greg Ward and if he'll be the true slot. It, right now, he's their slot receiver, but it doesn't mean he's going to stay that. I, he's going to lose snaps to Rager. Uh, clearly, when they went some, in, in some slot, in, in some eleven personnel, uh, Rager is going to be so interesting to, to to use. And by the way, people want to Justin Jefferson. Justin Jefferson can't do what Rager can do. Just he can't. That's why some teams I spoke with didn't think he he would work. He's going to be good though. By the way, Justin Jefferson's going to be a good player. But oh, yeah. you could use Rager a little bit more than you could use Jefferson in terms of ter- uh, formations. Yeah, I, I kind of look forward to doing the whole Jefferson versus Rager comparisons as the uh, years go on. I, I know the fans will be into that. Um, we're going to get some questions from our Apple uh, comments. But before we do that, I want to stop and thank our friends at PHLSportsNation.com, enhancing the fan experience by their coverage of all the Philly teams, the Eagles, the Sixers, the Flyers, the uh, uh, Eagles, Sixers, Flyers. Oh, yeah, the Phillies. Don't want to miss them. Oh, yeah. And uh, all their great podcasts, you know, they're they're for the fans, by the fans. So make sure you check out PHLSportsNation.com. And right now is a good time to pause for a word from our great sponsors. All right, Adam, uh, got some questions from people who left us great reviews, five-star reviews on Apple. So we want to get to them. First question comes from Abe Dimmitt. And he says, I appreciate the insight, guys. We know the Eagles have a good roster Good, great quarterback, young star, running back, top tight end duo, solid in the trenches, and now a number one corner. Are there any areas the Eagles need to address before the season to solidify themselves as a Super Bowl contender, or are they already there? Let's let's work backwards, Adam. Let's say the Eagles okay. made no moves. Okay. No more moves. No veteran running back, no veteran D end. They went into the season with this roster, or at least in the training camp. Are they a Super Bowl contender? Yes. Sure. I agree. Yeah. Now I'm I'm assuming that Rager, Goodwin, are going to be major factors. I'm assuming Sanders is going to be as special as we saw in the second half of the season. I'm assuming Slay is going to be a great corner for them. And I'm assuming Roby Coleman will be a terrific slot. Uh, team source said five, top five slot is how they saw it. Okay, that's what the tape showed. So I'm assuming, and oh, by the way, Hargrave is going to be who they thought he was. And Luke Jackson, all these questions are going to be answered in a positive light. If they're not, they're not going to be a Super Bowl team. They need, they needed, they were pathetic on offense in terms of speed last season. They've solved that issue, but those guys have to play. So to answer your question, all these things that we just outlined, if these guys are who they thought they would be this season, they're right there. They're a top five team for sure. Yeah, I will say this. Uh, I, I believe they are a Super Bowl contender right now, but I emphasize the word contender. I believe if you're in the playoffs, you are a Super Bowl contender because you're one of, you know, a, what, 15% of the league left. I mean, you're in, you made the playoffs. You have a chance to look what the Titans did last year, right? You have a chance to be in the mix as long as you're in the playoffs. And I think the Eagles have as much right to say, that they can win the NFC East as the Cowboys or any other team. They have the talent, as you just mentioned. Uh, every team is going to go through injuries. Every team is going to go through adversity. We expect certain guys to play well. We also understand certain guys that we think are going to play well are not going to play well, going to get hurt. But that the, the bottom line is from 1 to 53, the Eagles have enough talent to be in the playoffs to win the division, and that will make them a Super Bowl contender. One thing I do want to add mm-hmm. is that right now, so what's missing – a number two running back, they need an insurance policy behind Sanders. Okay, they, they, they need to do that. And my other concern is I'm just a little bit worried at corner. Avanti Maddox clearly is a talented player. But, Jeff, he is five mm-hmm. foot nine. There are some questions. You remember, they drafted to be their long-term slot corner. Let's call it like it is now because they're because City Jones has not been who they thought he, he would be. Mm-hmm. Maddox is having to play on the outside. That is a that is a question mark. I know it could run, but he is short. He's competitive. But Jeff, that is an issue for me. That that that's probably in terms of their starting lineup. They have well, they have two issues: left tackle, which clearly is an issue, and the corner opposite Slay. Those would be the two issues for me. Yeah, if you ask me right now, what one if if the Eagles could only upgrade one position with one signing. From now until the start of the season, which position Ooh. would it be? I would probably say corner. Offensive line, maybe, just because we talked about no veteran depth there. But there is talent on the offensive line. Not that there's not at a corner. They have Darius Slay, but they're literally a Darius Slay injury away from being 
the shortest bunch of corners you've ever seen in your life. So they've got to have, I, I, I could see that area still kind of, to me, holding them back if they were to be hurt or just guys don't live up to what they're supposed to be. All right. The next question comes from, I'm not even going to say that it's just a, 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 P, 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 F, 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 J, S. So I'm not even going to try to butcher that one. It's already, but um, we do thank this person because uh, they, they left a paragraph of very nice, praiseworthy things to say about inside the birds podcast. So we very much appreciate the great words. Uh, his question is with the Eagles draft. By the way, this is yes. a phenomenal question. This is, I agree. This is one of the best questions we've ever gotten. Go ahead. With the Eagles drafting Jalen hurts in the second round. Something I fear that we can see happening this season is Doug possibly forcing Jalen in the game on certain situations and it possibly backfiring on the team. And what I mean by that, for example, is on third and short, instead of calling a simple and efficient QB sneak with Wentz, they decide to put Hertz in and run a fancy or gadget type play and it ends up failing or there's miscommunication, yada, yada. This is something I can fear. Wanted to see if you guys think this could be a potential problem and the play calling or is Doug disciplined enough to not force Jalen on the field too often? Wow. Great question. Uh, you want to go first on that, Adam? Yeah, I here's – my response to that, they're going to have a package for, for Hertz. Uh, that's just an opinion. I just, it's, I felt that's exactly when the, the, the within 24 hours uh, after the trade, uh, excuse me, the, the, the shocking selection, uh, I felt the same way uh, based on people I've spoken to, they're going to figure it out. Now he has to know what he's doing. So if it goes into your question, if he knows what he's doing and it looks good in practice, I'm not opposed to it. And I, the, another reason why I like it, did you see what happened with Patrick Mahomes when he almost blew his knee out on the quarterback sneak? Uh, that's how he got hurt last season. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always wary of your, your franchise quarterback being used to block or on a sneak. Any time where there's a scrum, I'm good when it's a surprise. You know, I'm good when it's a surprise, but I'm, I'm not real great on exposing my quarterback in, in a pile. And considering Wentz has had such a significant injury history, uh, you you got to be careful here. This he's he's terrific talent, but it's a it, the, the thing that he's getting at though. Doug should not feel pressure because they took a quarterback in the second round to get him on the field. I'm more I'm more about developing as a number two quarterback, Jeff, for the future. The gadget stuff can wait. Like if it, you you could use it every couple games, that's fine. You, you got to be careful of how much you take also uh, Wentz off the field. That, that to me is, that to me is another factor here. So, but to answer your question, I, I hope that Doug does not feel forced to put him on the field uh, because they spent a second round pick on a quarterback that, that would, that would disappoint me, but it's fair to bring that up. Well, I'll take it one step further, Adam. I agree Good. with you on how I feel the coaches should handle it and working on him being the backup and everything like that. But I look, I mean, you've seen how aggressive Doug is. I don't think he'll feel pressure, but I think he will want to get Jalen Hurts on the field a couple of times per game to get those gadgets in. He he's that type of coach. He likes the gadgetry. And everybody says, well, why didn't he do it last year in December when he had Greg Ward? And now we've gone through this a million times. He had so many new guys who were just called up from the practice squad. It's hard to get them gadget plays when they're just trying to learn the playbook and survive on an everyday basis. So it wouldn't shock me if early on, and we'll see what kind of camp time that they get. Obviously yeah, that right, could impact right. it. But if there's a yes. normal training camp, I would expect to see Doug use Jalen Hurts early uh, as, as possible, even week one, week two. I think he wants that in his offense. I think he's a big proponent of that. Uh, his his uh, assistant, Press Taylor, has talked about the future of football being more than one thrower on the same time. Now, the question is, and, and I'm not trying to pick on fans or anything like that because as media, we tend to do this too, but there will never be a time where Doug has a gadget play that doesn't work that people will say, it was a good idea. It just didn't work. Whenever a gadget play doesn't work, it's never the right time. The opponent saw it coming. How dumb can you be? Everybody in the stadium knew that was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. I'm telling you, that's just the nature By of the way, fans and media. You, I'm just going to say, sit in our press box here and look at Financial Field. You'll hear them. Oh, my God. The, the media, I won't call. There, there are a couple beat reporters who just destroy the Eagles with this stuff. It's kind of comical. Right. They go after them. They, oh, what a dumb play. It's easy to second guess. Like, if they gave you the answers to the test, Jeff, you would never get it wrong. But since they're not, you know, uh, look, think about it, though. If What if Philly special didn't work? 
What an idiot. What the hell is he what doing? What an idiot. What yeah. a moron. By the way, did you hear the players? They were the shocked. Patriots. They were yeah. shocked that he did it. Brent Selleck, Brent Selleck right. here and him talking about it. Right. He was surprised. A lot of the guys were surprised. Yeah. Uh, look. Well, it, listen, when Doug was throwing screens last year, a couple of them were not working for a, a stretch there. And everybody was like, why are you throwing screens? They're not working. That's all you have in your passing offense. They know it's coming. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he stopped doing it for a while. And Where are the screens? You know, it's. Oh, the screen gamer kept complaining about it. Yeah, I know. Sure. I know. Yeah. I remember 2016, Adam, when they lost to the Cowboys. This is Doug's first year. Okay. They were winning that game. Oh, I think Ryan Matthews, time. don't say it. Don't no, say Wendell it. Smallwood comes oh. in and fumbles oh, yeah, on his yeah, yeah, first yeah, yeah, carry, yeah. and Doug got blamed yeah. because that was Wendell's first carry, and he was coming in cold. Oh, and I'm right, like, sure. Is there some kind of data that says that every running back fumbles on his first carry or is more prone? I mean, people wanted to <laughs> yeah, kill Doug because Wendell Smallwood fumbled and his usage of, oh, well, you didn't give him a, he didn't get any carries in the first half. So he came in cold. What does that um, mean? Yeah, every I time know, a running back takes the first yeah. play of the game, they're coming in cold, right? Yeah, I, I sure. don't, I never got that. No, it's a great <laughs> question. And, you know, the, the thing about Doug feeling pressure to, Look, when you're when you're giving us a, a quarterback the second round of super athletic, uh, you're you're probably going to at least internally think, you know what, we've got a different option here, a quarterback, or is a a different kind of positional player. Yeah, he's a quarterback first, but he could be put in. If you keep Wentz in here and you have Jalen, either to his left or to his right, you're the defense is like, what the hell are they doing? They're probably going to call a timeout. They're not going to be ready for it. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right, let's uh, kind of do speed through the next uh, two here, uh, okay. two or three. Uh, Ryan, 33-22, just wants to th- know if we think J- Jason Peters is coming back. And is there any chance he'd be a backup if he it's, came back? <laughs> it's not a question of would he accept being a backup. The, the answer is he wouldn't. And he would take the job, is my opinion, because he'll just he, – he's farther advanced, obviously, than, than Dillard is. It, it, if Dillard had looked really good – when he played last season, he showed some upside, but he, he also got overpowered at times. If he looked like he was ready, Jeff, we're not talking about Jason Peters. He would not be back. Mm-hmm. It, it's, there's some question that that's, that's the fact. I mean, what people could say what they want and then whether the owner's involved or not, whatever conspiracy theory that you have, people love the conspiracy, conspiracy theories I'm more about football than, than speculation. Right. Uh, we're, we're more about answers than speculation on the show. So uh, that's kind of where I see it, man. I, I, I they haven't ruled it out, and uh, I still don't understand why they have or haven't. That's up to them. But if Dealer, if they thought Dealer was the man right now, we wouldn't be talking about Jason Peters. All right, moving on to InsideTheBirds.com questions real quick. Uh, Everson Griffin or Ezekiel Anse? You think the Eagles go after either one of those guys as a rotational guy? Uh, Anse, he was toast last season with the, the Seahawks. He didn't look very good. He's 30. Yeah. Sh- so many injuries. Shoulder has been – He's he looked like he was toast. Griffin is just going to cost you much. It's um, he's in his thirties. A terrific football player, by the way, and yeah. overcomes some personal challenges. Good for him. Um, yeah, definitely. Real talented player, but again, I they, like him. If they were going to do something, my sense is it would be for Ngakwe. If they were going to do something big, mm-hmm. Griffin would be a one-year solution. But situationally, yeah, he would be a good situational pass rusher. I don't know that he's willing to accept that. We're, we're talking about Everson Griffin here. I, well, I how many starting how many starting defensive end jobs for Everson Griffin are available at this point in May? Well, look, Seattle could use one. Oh, they, they're hurting. They're Good hurting point. at the end. That's the position where it, they have interest in him. So I, I could see that getting done there. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's, you know, Ngakwe is a long shot, as I've said for two months now when we first started talking about it. But I just know this. Eagles like the player, but they're, they are not inclined to do anything right now. All right, let's uh, – and by the way, you know, maybe if things don't work out with Vinny Curry, then they do look around a different avenue for – Yeah, that's true. true. Of them. We'll, we might know more about that by the end of this week. Okay. Uh, next question, insidethebirds.com. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have a name for this, but um, yeah. if Jamal Adams becomes available via trade, should the Birds be interested? And, um, you know, what would the Birds be willing to give up? Adam, I just don't think at this point how he wants to give up really high draft picks and a lot of money for a, a player at a position that he does not historically value with that high of draft pick and that much money. Well, they have paid, listen, they have, they did pay Jenkins. That was a tremendous transaction. Uh, they, but that was a bargain. Remember they got him at a bargain when they initially signed. No, him. but after they, they, after they extended him, they made oh, him the a second top, one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. They made him a top five safety. Right. Um, 
I don't see it. I, I don't see it. And by the way, the, the Jets, other than Darnold, will make any player available. Joe Douglas believes in taking the phone calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, m- talking to a Jets source within the last few weeks, they want to eventually extend Adams' contract. They, they know he's a star. Adams wants his deal now. They're not inclined to do it right now. We'll see how that goes, but uh, I, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. Again, if they were going to do anything, it would be DN a game changer. Now, Adams is a stud. He's the best strong safety in the National Football League. The Jets love the kid. I know the staff inherited him, but they know how great he is. But again, um, they're not inclined to invest their money in safety. I think it would be more into defensive end. All right, that will do it for this edition of Inside the Birds. Want to thank our producer, Hunter Brody. Find his work on his YouTube channel, Sports Talk with Broge. Check out his podcast with former Villanova star, Daryl Reynolds. It's called Process. So make sure you check that out and also find him on Twitter, at Broads81. Catch the latest Inside the Birds uh, podcast on any platform you listen to. Check out our YouTube channel and also check out InsideTheBirds.com. We hope you all had a great Memorial Day weekend, and we'll catch you on the next Inside the Birds. Thanks for flying with us. Inside the Birds.